Will we find beauty inside this beast? Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. Today we're going to see if there's beauty hiding inside this beast. Now this is a rough turn, twice turn bowl. It has been turned the first time with a thick wall. This is the wall thickness is 10% of the overall diameter and it's been allowed to dry. And now we're going to turn the inside of this and see what's inside of it. This is what's known as a twice turning. If you want to learn more about that, check out the video right here and you can learn all about twice turning. So this relatively ugly bowl should have something pretty nice hiding inside. Let's see what we can find. Okay, so I'm going to use my separated flat jam chuck to mount this to the lathe. Now the reason that jam chuck has a void in the center is because these large bowl blanks, when they dry, the pith area on the end grain will rise or will appear to rise. Actually, the sides drop down. So the sides will be even and the end grain ends will be kind of pushed up. So the pushed up area sits inside that void and it helps it balance out a lot better than just a flat surface. You can also use the tool rest and your thumb just to determine where there's any high spots and use that as a guide to straighten out the bowl before you tighten up the tailstock. Okay, so I'm gonna use my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge to clean up the tenon the shoulder and the base of the bowl here using a scraping cut. And then I'm going to turn around and make a push cut. Push cut's going to give me a cleaner finish and it's just a it's just a nicer, smoother cut versus a scraping cut. But right up against that shoulder, a scraping cut is a good way to go because it's impossible to get the bevel in there. So I'm going to make a few passes. I know I have a low spot on this bowl where there's some bark area. So I'm going to make a few passes and then check that and see how much farther I need to go down on the surface. And there's that bark area. And I've also got a crack in the sap wood or the wood that's just underneath the bark there and it's a little bit of a concern. So you want to take your time and make a nice smooth clean pass with each cut. What we're doing here is we're basically balancing out the exterior of the bowl. While this bowl dried after the first turning it became a little bit deformed. So there's gonna be high spots and low spots on each side of this bowl. So we need to balance those out and smooth them out. Here you can see making a grain supported cut with the grain here is gonna be almost impossible. So what I'm doing is I'm using a scraping cut to get in there. The shear scrape is a great way to smooth out the surface of the bowl. And it's gonna take off those high spots and those tool marks and transition all those different levels all into one smooth surface. Here you can see how the handle is dropped on the bowl gouge for the shear scrape. If you want to learn more about shear scraping, I've got a video all about it. You can check that out. Okay, that crack is still really prominent. Now I. I'm a bit concerned, but I don't think it's going to be major because I think it's only going down into the wood just a little bit here. But what I'm going to do is, even though I've already smoothed off that surface, I'm going to take this bowl down just a little bit deeper because I really want to get down and see how deep that crack is into the base of this bowl. It's one of those things you have to accept when you're turning green wood that you collect yourself. There's a chance that you may lose some pieces. If this crack were to go all the way through the bowl, I pretty much would not be using it. I would discard it and move on to a different piece of wood. And the crack's still there. It's pretty, pretty prominent still. So I'm going to go ahead and 
I'm going to reduce that surface just a bit more. I do have a way of dealing with that crack. And I'm going to show you that to you later in this video. I'm not convinced that that crack is a major structural crack, meaning I don't think it's going to continue. What happens is the sap wood on the exterior of the log, just underneath the bark, is usually much wetter than the heartwood in the inside of the log. The heartwood on this particular piece of pecan is that darker brown area in the center. And it's a lot more stable, the heartwood. The sapwood, because it's so wet, it tends to crack a lot more than the heartwood will. And that usually happens when the wood is initially beginning its drying process. And I believe, I want to believe, let's put it that way, I want to believe that that has stabilized now in the sapwood and that crack is not going to progress and be an issue down the road. But I do want to get down into it far enough that I'm not dealing with it later. Okay, so that appears to be deep enough. So the bottom of this bowl is shaped the way it is, partially because of the wood itself and getting past that crack. So a lot of times you do need to let the wood dictate the shape of the bowl and what you're going to be able to yield from a particular piece of wood. At this point, I'm going to work up the side walls. And the only thing I want to do is make sure that the sides are balanced. I don't want there to be any low spots. So I want to make a nice clean pass all the way across it. When I go to mount this bowl in the chuck, I'm going to need to retrue that exterior. So we're going to get it pretty close right now, but it doesn't need to be perfect at this point. And I'm not going to go all the way up to the padding on this particular jam chuck. Instead, I'm going to work up close to it. But I'll clean up the rim of the bowl when we reverse it in just a few moments. Just make nice, light push cuts. If you notice, I have the bowl gouge rotated to the left so that the nose is pointing at about the 10 o'clock position on that clock face. The flute is pretty open here, and that's okay because I make a very, I'm making a very light pass. If I were to make a deeper, more aggressive pass, this is a good way to get a catch, having the flute open like that. Okay, so we're going to do some more shear scraping to smooth the surface here and connect those transitions. You can see the different tool marks here and where there's been lines created from the different sections. And that's kind of par for the course. That's how this works. You're going to want to work in sections and just gradually work down the side of the bowl until you get the shape and the texture or the finish that you're looking for. Okay, I need to true up the tenon. The spindle detail gouge has a really nice point on it and it's great for making this push cut with an inside angle. This is about an 11, 10 to 11 degree angle that matches the jaws of my four jaw chuck. So I'm going to clean this out, true that up, and then I'm going to want to make sure that that little corner down the bottom is cleaned up really well so that the chuck will grip that tenon very cleanly. All right, that's looking good. So now we're going to take the bowl off the jam chuck and then we'll go ahead and put it in the four jaw chuck using the tenon that we just cleaned up. You can see the interior of the bowl is still thick and kind of not so pretty. It is, it's really like Beauty and the Beast because <laughs> this bowl blank is pretty ugly when you start off and you know, you, you rough it out and it's it's just thick and you don't need to really be shaping it to design it or anything. You just need a, a rough bowl shape. And it really isn't that attractive at first, but underneath all of those layers is this really beautiful bowl. Okay, so I'm using my thicker bowl gouge, a little bit heavier so I can get a little more stability as I'm cleaning up the exterior of this bowl. Now, why would I be cleaning the exterior of the bowl again? Even though we got pretty close to making this very balanced and true when we had it initially on the lathe, when we reverse it and mount it into the four jaw chuck, that tenon is going to be off just a little bit. And you can actually hear the high spots here. That little clicking or the wobbling sound is making that 
is made by the fact that there's high spots and low spots. So I'm gonna basically, I use the shear scrape there to clean it up. Now I'm using a push cut to come up and clean up this rim. I'm not gonna take this all the way to the end because I don't wanna rip out that grain. So I'll come around to the face here and just make a really light push cut to clean up the rim of this bowl. And that's looking pretty good. So I'm back to my 5 8 inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. This is the heavier of the two bowl gouges and it it basically provides a little more stability to make a nice, clean, smooth shear scraping pass like I'm doing right now. And the whole idea of this, of this is just to shave off any high spots and smooth that out. Okay, so pecan wood is relatively hard and it does a good job on the bull gouges as far as dulling them. So I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to sharpen both of my bowl gouges. This is my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. I'm using the one way Wolverine sharpening system and CBN wheels. The wheel that I use is an inch and a half wide 180 grit CBN wheel on the right. I use that for sharpening. The wheel on the left is an 80 grit wheel and I use that for shaping. Once a bowl gouge is shaped you really don't need to be using the coarse wheel. The finer wheel is will work well for sharpening, and that's what I'm doing here. I just need to clean up both of those bevels and make sure I've got a nice clean bevel all the way up to the cutting edge, and then both of my gouges will be sharp. Okay, so this exterior of the bowl is pretty much cleaned up. I'm gonna take my time and shape the rim of the bowl next. Now there's a high spot on there. If you notice, I'm, I'm moving from the, t the right to the left off of that high spot. That is the supported grain cut direction. If you wanna learn more about supported grain cut, I've got a video all about that, check it out. And, you know, dig down into my into my video library. I've got a ton of foundational videos that will give you a lot of information about the basic techniques and the things you really need to know to get good at turning wood bowls. Okay, so I repositioned the tool rest and I'm going to make a scraping cut here to just further refine the curve on the top of that rim. I'm just taking my time and making a light shaving pass here. Okay, with the rim established, now I'm gonna start working the interior of the bowl and we'll start shaping down into the bowl and creating the interior. Pretty straightforward. The biggest thing to, to remember when you start a rim cut like that is to have the bowl gouge at a 90 degree angle and just let the tip of the gouge start making a little ledge on the rim before you start pushing into the cut. Okay, so with the first pass established, now I can decide exactly how I want the rim to be shaped down into the bowl. And I really, I typically like to make my rims go downward or slope downward into the bowl. So what I did is I, I did one more push cut there, but now I'm going to make a scraping cut that's going to refine that. And you can see there's an, a top rim or a top curve to the top of the rim there. I'm just going to smooth that out. Okay, so now I need to take some passes and remove some material to get down to my wall thickness. And I'm going to have this inside wall is going to pretty much undercut the rim. So I really need to come way across the lathe with my bowl gouge in order to get underneath that rim. The 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge really does that well. I'm just taking my time here finessing that rim 
Just want to make sure I've got it exactly the way I want it. All right, that's looking pretty good. Okay, this is my micro bevel bowl, bowl gouge. This has a six, about a 60 degree bevel. It can be between 60, 65 degrees is what I use. You could possibly go as much as 70 degrees with this or more. And what happens is I'm able to introduce this almost straight into the area that I'm cutting. Now, I do need to reach all the way across the lathe to make this cut. But what's nice about this is I'm immediately making a cut on a, on a bevel-supported guide with the, the nose of the bull gouge pointed to almost straight into the, the cutting area. This is great for undercut rims like this, and it's also great for deeper bowls. I'm going to be using this down in the bottom of this bowl where it's a little bit difficult to get to with the, the regular bowl gouge. Okay, I'm using a light scraping cut right on the inside of that rim with my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. I've got the rim or the flute facing the area that's being cut and has back, basically the bottom wing of the bowl gouge is what was doing the scraping. Now with my heavier bowl gouge, this is the 5 8 inch bowl gouge, I'm gonna make some roughing passes. This is just to remove material and to get down to that wall thickness. All right, so I'm going to use my calipers just to get a rough idea of where I am. I'm not trying to make this bowl very thin. This bowl is meant to be very functional, to be used for many, many years, and to be able to take some occasional abuse, being dropped and things like that. I'm using my round nose scraper here to scrape the high spots and any kind of tool marks that may still remain on the inside of that curve. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now before I remove all the material on the inside of the bowl. Even as thick as I've made this bowl, there's a chance that it can flex a little bit by the time I remove all of the material in the center. So while I have a little bit of that material down at the bottom of this bowl, which helps support this and stabilize it, I'm just going to go ahead and finalize everything up near the rim at this point. I've taken and I've tilted the round nose scraper just a bit so that it's just scraping and it won't create a catch that way. This is a half inch bowl gouge and I'm going to start removing the material down into the bottom of this bowl. And you can see at the 55 degree bevel angle that the shaft of the flute is almost touching the rim of the bowl. And if, I'm, if the rim is interfering with the bevel, then I'm most likely not riding the bevel. And if I'm not riding, riding the bevel, then I'm scraping and I'm going to make tool marks. So I don't want that. I want to be able to ride the bevel all the way to the bottom of the bowl. So the way to do that, if you can't get there with the bowl gouge you're using, is to use a micro bevel. Some people call that a bottom feeder because it's designed to go into the bottom of the bowl. This is another caliper that I like to use. This really helps me determine how thick the walls are all the way down. I'll put a link to that and all the tools that I'm using in this video in the description for this video. Okay, so now you can see the angle of the micro bevel. This has about, like I said, about a 60, 65 degree angle bevel. I'm almost straight in with this bull gouge and you can see the shavings coming off. I'm not scraping, I'm cutting with this. So the nice thing about the micro bevel is it will allow you to reach deep into the bowl and rarely will the rim create interference for you. I'm just going to take my time and work these layers down. We don't want to make deep cuts here where we know we're getting close to the final thickness for this bowl. One of the biggest things with getting the wall thickness correct that takes a little bit of time, and unfortunately I think we all have to go through the bottom of a couple bowls at least a few times so that we understand what's happening is, is you really want to just sneak up on that thickness. I'm checking the thickness here. I can see right in the bottom there it's still thick and you can actually see it. 
it's flat across the bottom and almost convex. I want that bottom of the bowl and the bottom of all my bowls to be concave and to match the curve of the bowl. So I want it to be a nice fluid curve that goes right through the base of the bowl from in the interior. And the best way to describe this is we need to sneak up on that final pass. We don't want to make bold, aggressive, deep cuts at this point. We're just making very light cuts to get to the final thickness that we want. Okay, and use your fingers because you're going to be able to immediately tell when there's an issue. And here I can feel there's a high spot. What I'm doing is I'm marking both sides of the high spot, the left and the right side, and the high spots in the middle. So now using my micro bevel bowl gouge, I'm just going to work gently across the center of that. I'm making a pass where I'm just clipping the top of that area and I'm not digging down into the area beside it very much. I'm just kind of feathering the cut into the area beside it. Okay, that took care of that high spot. And I'll, again, I'll use the round nose scraper just to gently smooth out any of the transition areas, take off any of the very small high spots and or tool marks and clean, clean that whole area up. And I feel one more spot that's got a little bit of a high spot there, and I want to address that. By marking it with the pencil, it assures that you're going to target that area, and you don't accidentally make an area beside that, the high spot, lower than it should be. This way you're working just the area that needs attention. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start sanding this. Now, I do know that there's a few issues with the exterior of this piece. We have a bark enclosure hole and we've got that crack near the base of the bowl and I want to address both of those before we get into the finish for this particular bowl. I sand on the edge of the sanding mandrel there. You can see I'm not here it looks like the full sanding pad is engaging but it's not. It's just the bottom right side of that sanding pad is what's engaging the wood. If you want to learn more about sanding, I have a video all about sanding. You might want to check that out. It's a lot of good information there. Okay, so here's the bark enclosure hole that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to use a small dental pick to get any loose material out of there. And then I'm going to use the air compressor and blow out all the debris inside that crack. And once the area is clean, I need to dam up the back of this. So I'm going to use a piece of gaffer's tape. If you've seen any of my other videos, you know I love gaffer's tape. It's super durable and doesn't leave a lot of residue. If you're liking this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen because it helps this video and helps the whole channel and I thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to use a two-part five-minute epoxy to fill this hole in the bowl. This is a bark enclosure area and the way the epoxy works is there's two parts. There's a resin and a hardener. I actually have to squeeze this pretty hard. I actually store this in the refrigerator so it lasts a long time. But you put equal parts of the hardener and the resin. I use the masking tape to make a little work area there. Now I'm using a turquoise mica powder. You see that amount that I have on the toothpick there? I'm going to do about two times that. And that's more than enough for what we're going to be doing here. So you want to take your time and mix that up really well. Mix the two parts together and mix the color into it really well. And then we'll start filling the hole. Now I'm going to use that toothpick to work the epoxy deep down into these crevices, especially on the ends. I want to make sure that it gets into all of those areas. Just take your time and fill it in there. Well, don't take too much time because this is five minute epoxy. It usually gets pretty, it stays kind of gummy for a good five or ten minutes. I usually give it about 30 minutes to really harden before I start sanding it again. 
And you want to spread it and make sure it's sitting somewhere where it's level so it dries level and doesn't run out. Okay, so I've let the epoxy dry. Now I'm going to address the cracks on the bottom of this bowl. I'm using wood glue. This is Tight Bond 3, which is a waterproof wood glue. And I'm making just a really fine bead on top of each of those cracks. And then quickly, I'm going to press that glue down into the cracks. You really don't want too much excess glue on top. And then you take the sandpaper, this happens to be 150 grit sandpaper, and you just quickly sand across that area. And what's going to happen is, it's almost like magic, the, the little crack disappears. The sand from the sanding will adhere to the glue on the top and the friction from your sanding is going to dry the top surface of that glue. So it almost just a magically, it just magically erases the crack. Now there's a really small one on this side too, and I'm going to go ahead and fix that. Like I said, I don't think these are major structural cracks. I don't think they're going to continue. I think they occurred initially when the bowl first started drying and they've, they've stabilized at this point. But putting a little glue in there is going to help stabilize them even more and prevent them from spreading open and cracking further. Okay, so now I'm using more coarse sandpaper. This is 80 grit sanding disc. And I'll just work that down till it's smooth. And then I'll work up to 120 and then 180 grit. And then you can see the epoxy just blends right in. And at that point, I'll just do my finished sanding on the exterior and the interior. I sand all the way up to 320 grit, which gives me a nice smooth finish. All right. Now, I'm going to use my favorite finish for this particular bowl. This is Tried and True's Original. This is linseed oil and beeswax and nothing else. I mean, absolutely nothing else. There's no, no additional chemicals. There's no metals in this. There's no dryers. There's nothing. It is linseed oil and beeswax. That's why I like this product so much. I am not sponsored by tried and true i just really really do like this product the way this needs to be applied is one thin layer just enough finish to coat the wood if you are seeing finish on the wood you have enough there you do not want this to be thick you want to make sure that any thick areas gets spread out and or thinned or wiped off because any thick areas will become gummy over time just want to put a thin layer on and then after an hour, just go ahead and wipe it down with a clean cloth and that will hit any other high areas and prevent those, those high thick areas from lasting. And then what we want to do is we're going to wait one whole day. It does require a little bit of patience to apply this properly, but when it's applied properly, this is a great finish, especially for a salad bowl. I love how it brings out all the colors immediately. And this pecan looks gorgeous. So after a day, you can see that the oil has settled into the wood a bit. Now what I'm using is 4 ot steel wool. And I'm simply going to burnish this. I'm going to put the lathe on slow to medium speed. And just gently rub it with the steel wool. What this is doing is burnishing the finish into the wood. It's also removing any excess high spots of the finish. You can see it there. Just basically pull the steel wool apart and flip it over and you can continue using the steel wool with a new clean area. And you're going to work all the surfaces of the bowl, the inside, the rim, as well as the exterior. You can see it immediately creating a luster on the wood too.
Now this finish is not waterproof, but it's water resistant and it's 100% food safe. This is a, the ideal finish to use for a salad bowl like this. All right, so now we need to take the tenon off of the bowl and create the foot area. I'm gonna use a padded jam chuck. This will give me full rim support all the way around the bowl. The tail stock will be holding it in place. Because I already had this on the lathe with the tail stock, there's already a hole where the quill goes right into the tailstock. So I just line that up and I should be pretty much centered and balanced right off the, the bat there. Now I'm going to use a push cut with my half inch bowl gouge. And I'm going to remove the tenon. At this point we do not need the tenon. It has served its purpose and we are going to shape the foot of this bowl. The push cut is the best cut here because what's going to happen is you're applying pressure into the headstock as opposed to against the headstock. And that's going to keep the bowl mounted well on the jam chuck and prevent it from hopping off the lathe, which we obviously don't want. I'm going to make a light push cut to determine about the depth that I want the inside of this foot to be. And the goal here is to take the curve of the bowl that you see here and continue that curve right through the base of the bowl or through the bottom of the foot. I'm doing a light backwards pulling scrape to create the thickness for the feet. And then I'm going to do a push cut, very open push cut. You want to make this a light cut because you don't want to get a catch here, obviously. Light, light cuts and scrapes. Nothing dramatic here. I'm completely open. That flute is pointing straight up. You want to be very careful when you do that. Now I'm going to use my flat scraper. I rarely use this, but this is really nice to get in there and clean up that corner on the inside of the foot to the bottom base of the bowl. Again, make very light scrapes with this tool. And I'm trying not to engage the entire tool because that could become too aggressive and create a catch. All right, so the inside of the foot has been shaped, so I'm going to continue shaping the curve of the bottom of the bowl. And we'll take the little nub down. Again, push cuts in towards the headstock. And I want to be very delicate and careful here. You also don't want to tighten the tailstock at this point because it can compress that little nub. You want to make sure it was secure enough before you started. Now I'm using my detail spindle gouge to clean up this last bit of area and clean up the bottom curve of the bowl. Again, very light cuts here. Then we'll take the nub down to just a little bit narrower diameter before we cut it off. All right, then with a little bit of pressure, I'm going to push into that nub and help sever it from the, the bowl. Right here, I'm going to push in and then turn the lathe off. Sometimes it'll cut immediately. Sometimes you have to turn the bowl by hand like I'm doing now, but it will cut all those fibers and then it'll simply pop right off. Okay, so we don't need the jam chuck anymore. We're going to take that off the lathe. And I'm going to put in my Jacob's chuck with a sanding mandrel. This is a two inch sanding mandrel. Use this to clean up that little nub area in the center of the bottom of the bowl. And there's our bowl. Wow, I love that turquoise inlay. That is awesome. Look at the color in the, in the grain in this pecan. I'm always amazed by the different types of wood I'm able to turn, and uh, this is this is why I love turning bowls right here. Wow.
Well, there we have it. There was something beautiful hiding inside that ugly beast of a once turned bowl. I got to tell you, the first time I ever did a twice turning, I had one of those big, ugly, roughed out bowls that had been dried on the lathe. I thought, I don't know why I'm doing this. There's nothing good that's going to happen from it. But I'll tell you what, it's surprising how beautiful the bowl is that's hiding inside that rough turned piece. Now, this particular piece had a couple imperfections, but those I actually really like. I, I like to embrace those because they give every bull a unique character that's unlike any other bull. So those little imperfections are actually a big bonus in my book. So tell me what you think about the twice turning and this twice turn bull. Have you tried twice turning? If you haven't, are you going to consider doing it now that you've seen this video? Leave me a comment below. I love hearing your feedback on these videos and I try to get to all my comments and respond to it. So I'll respond to your comment if you leave a comment below. Do me a huge favor. Click that like button below the screen if you haven't already because YouTube looks at your engagement with these videos. And when you click that like button, it tells YouTube that you like this video, but it also helps spread this video to other people and it helps out my channel. And I greatly appreciate you doing that. Also, click that subscribe button if you're not already subscribing and click the bell. That way you'll be notified each time a new video comes out of mine. And I've got tons more on the way as well as a plenty of videos for you to go look at now in my library. If you haven't already seen my website, turnerwoodbull.com, you're going to want to check that out. Whether you're just thinking about turning wood bowls or if you've been turning wood bowls for a long time, I've got tons of information for you. And I've made the web address really simple. It's turn a wood bull. Yeah turnawoodbull.com. It's that simple. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't already. And as you probably already know, I love finishing my videos and articles with a common phrase. And that phrase is, until next time, happy turning.